So, here we are at the end. The big question. What does all this mean? In Damned If I Know, that's the great human mystery, elusive to every artist, philosopher, and shaman, ever to try to make sense of this crazy world. Fiction operates in these grounds, as I told you from the outset. Remember? Explores the nature of the human condition? Well, that's necessarily deep stuff if you're going there. And you don't have to go there. You might also remember that my definition of good fiction made room for entertains as well. Which means if you want to write steamy romance novels that sell well because they enrich a bunch of lives with the titillation your readers aren't getting in their day-to-day, -day, amen. Good on you. Same for all the aspiring James Pattersons, whose readers are out there now, fantasizing about single-handedly taking down a terrorist cell while they punch a clock at their accounting firms or IT service desks. Those books are no less good than the artsy ones, and they may do far more good than we know by filling gaps that most people's mundane reality cannot fill, or is not filling at the moment. Most of us wouldn't last very long in a 24-7 bare-knuckle adventure, or a never-ending non-stop sex romp. I suspect this is one of the major functions of fiction, to keep us busy and ready in our downtime, and perhaps even prepare us for those rare times when things do get crazy on us, and they will. What to make of the deeper parts of this fiction stuff is essentially the question we're wrestling with in this lesson. This is the type of stuff that can send even the greatest philosophers into a tailspin, and if there's anything less productive than a tailspin for a fiction writer, I don't know what it is. Pondering the depths of the metaphysics of fiction isn't going to help you to be a better writer. Becoming a better writer is. But if you're one of those people who needs an overarching narrative that explains why you do what you do, I'll give you a quick rundown of what I've learned on this front. We write and read about what matters to us as humans, and books that don't hit on stuff that matters quickly get weeded out of the marketplace. The enduring classics from all cultures are filled with information about the deep and abiding questions of human nature. Ideologically minded scholars and critics tend to be highly critical of the very idea of human universals, intent instead on pointing their focus at the cultural differences that make groups of people distinct. Fair enough, there are good reasons to do this, but to do it to the exclusion of the reality that humans share far more in common than the idiosyncrasies that separate us seems both counterfactual and counterproductive to me. Postcolonial scholar Patrick Colm Hogan addresses this scholarly proclivity to avoid discussing universals in a manner I think captures the essence of what makes stories such an effective cross-cultural vehicle. He writes, Literature, or more properly, verbal art, is not produced by nations, periods, and so on. It is produced by people. And these people are incomparably more alike than not. They share ideas, perceptions, desires, aspirations, and emotions. And the evidence produced by those who have begun to study literature from a more scientific perspective tends to follow a similar trajectory, according to evolutionary psychologist Robin Dunbar, who writes, Although attempts to explore the nature of drama and literature from an evolutionary perspective are still very much in their infancy, those that have been undertaken agree that the great themes of literature are invariably also the great themes of life, mate choice, parenting, survival, group cohesion, and the hero triumphing in the face of adversity. Steven Pinker tackles the same question from a cognitive standpoint in his book How the Mind Works, offering a good reason why fictional stories are a human universal. When the fictional illusions work, there is no mystery as to the question why do people enjoy fiction. It is identical to the question why do people enjoy life. When we are absorbed in a book or movie, we get to see breathtaking landscapes, hobnob with important people, fall in love with ravishing men and women, protect loved ones, attain impossible goals, and defeat wicked enemies. And the better a job a piece of fiction does at helping us to simulate these engaging experiences, the more people enjoy it and buy it. The prestige, wealth, and influence that goes with creating a culturally significant story has been a part of the storytelling process since the only stories told were told around campfires. Let's face it. Storytellers aren't just out to explore human existence and enrich the lives of others, although that's a nice goal to which many storytellers aspire. But 
For just as many, it's about elevating themselves in the eyes of their peers. If an author says that they're not after the fame and prestige that goes along with writing a bestseller or a critically acclaimed book, let's be kind and say that they're at least being partly disingenuous, and grant that they may care about the art more. But homegirl's still gotta eat, and her studio in Brooklyn ain't cheap. And why choose to live in Brooklyn instead of, say, a single wide in Salina, Kansas? Let's at least be honest with ourselves about what we're doing, if we're going to do it. But why should creating fiction elevate one in prestige and pay? Simple. It's for the same reason Pinker notes above. People enjoy it and are willing to pay for the privilege. And transcendent fiction is rare. So if or when one does write something great, they deserve the spoils that go with it. Whatever fiction does mean, though, it's probably impossible to qualify either in individual cases or generally. But we can say that fiction means something to almost everyone. It is meaningful. It keeps us entertained and exploring our existence, especially in the facets of our lives we don't fully comprehend and cannot clearly articulate. We can say this much about its meaning, at least, and we'll say a bit more as this lesson progresses. But for now, let's take a closer look at a couple of the tools that exist in the realm of meaning. Because if this series of lessons is about anything, it's about building tools for writers to use in their meaningful fiction. The first meaning tool worth mentioning is the symbol. Symbols pop up constantly in literary stories. Put simply, symbols are images or objects that carry meaning beyond their literal role in the story. In the short story Man and Wife by Katie Chase, the character narrator, a young schoolgirl, lives in a strange but somewhat familiar story world where everything seems like contemporary America, complete with bicycles, barbecues, and Barbie playhouses. Yet the girls are married off in middle school to be housewives in arranged marriages. In the story, the Barbies keep appearing again and again as the protagonist tries to cling to her childhood while being simultaneously forced to grow up far too fast. The Barbies are symbolic, a small piece of the girl's childhood innocence. And by the end of the story, the narrator has outgrown them. They're dolls, yes, but they're not just dolls. They carry more meaning than a simple plastic object for a child to play with. They stand in for the significance that play holds for a developing child, and even for how the specific ways children play conveys cultural information about their society. The second meaning tool worth mentioning in this context is the epiphany. I've mentioned the epiphany briefly before in the context of plot. I'm going to stick with the framework I used then because it works well to get at the heart of a seemingly slippery and abstract concept. An epiphany is an event or realization that causes the character to question a significant chunk of their knowledge world. Some of this may transfer to the reader as well. It's as though the world opens a new window for the character, and through this window there's a reality that either significantly widens or contradicts the knowledge base that character was operating with prior to this revelation. Perhaps the most often cited example is James Joyce's short story, Araby. But you'll also find epiphanies in just about every Flannery O'Connor short story, all of which are worth a read. Usually a character has a limited, idealistic, or unrealistic view of reality that gets smashed to pieces by the harder real-world aspects of the story world. In the case of Araby, the narrator, a young boy, has built up an unrealistic expectation of the Araby Bazaar, and he promises to go and bring back a souvenir for a girl he has a crush on, whom he also idealizes in an unrealistic way. When he makes it to the bazaar, he finds the place superficial, drab, and ugly, dashing his hopes in a way that shakes his knowledge world, prompting a re-evaluation of his entire outlook. Is that crush of his really as wonderful as he's built her up to be as well? Epiphanies are usually something like this. The last of the meaning tools we'll discuss here is essentially the meaning itself, which is usually expressed in literary terms as a work's theme. Symbols and epiphanies often stack up, cumulatively, to generate a story's theme. But this is an algebra. Meaning is a messy business, and you're not likely to get too much agreement on a story's theme from a diverse group of readers, even if we were to concede that most stories even have a theme as such. 
Most stories carry multiple thematic elements, and what those themes are is largely open to interpretation. But themes often serve as metaphorical or allegorical representations of human life or society, which the reader then brings back with them to their own lives. In this way, themes become their own large-scale metaphorical elements, where the story world acts as the source and the reader's life is the target, expanding the reader's understanding of their own world through the story's events and emotional coloring. It's something like that. So let's take a crack at figuring out how these three meaning-making elements might work in a story. And since I've made such a fuss about Moby Dick over the course of these lessons, it'll make a fitting conclusion here. Melville's epic is certainly rich territory on all three counts. Let's start with the symbol. You know, the big one. The size of which Melville didn't hesitate to exaggerate, even beyond its massive real-world size. How then, with me, writing of this Leviathan... Unconsciously, my chirography expands to placard capitals. Give me a condor's quill. Give me Vesuvius's crater for an inkstand. Friends, hold my arms. For in the mere act of penning my thoughts of this leviathan, they weary me and make me faint with their overreaching comprehensiveness of sweep, as if to include the whole circle of the sciences and all the generation of whales and men and mastodons, past, present, and to come, with all the revolving panoramas of empire on earth and throughout the whole universe, not excluding its suburbs. Yes, friends, the whale. And the whale looms so large over the story, the first chapter is literally titled Loomings. So, what does the whale symbolize, you may ask? And the answer may depend on whom you ask, but since I'm the one talking, and I favor explications on literature that demonstrate literature's universal appeals, and great literature's appeal to those universals, I say the whale symbolizes the threatening side of nature, for there is no more universal struggle than ours against nature. Survival wasn't just a question to be dealt with for our ancestors, it was the question. This is easy to forget in an era of supermarkets, emergency rooms, and antibiotics. Contending with nature was a dangerous prospect, and one that for many people couldn't be avoided. The natural world needed to be reckoned with, and surely as it feeds us generously one day, it will greedily gobble us up. Part of the acquired wisdom of our ancestors' struggle with nature was the reality that the natural world bites back when you challenge it. And let's face it, the arrogance of a five foot ten land dwelling mammal setting to the sea to hunt the ocean's most massive creatures, armed with only skiffs, harpoons, and ropes? Well, that's one bold and hubristic undertaking, to say the least. Ahab fought the whale and got his leg bit off for his trouble. To a stable, well adjusted person with an understanding of his place in the universe, this is the cost of doing business in those waters, high though it may be. Ahab was having none of it, though. He vowed vengeance on nature itself by swearing to hunt the legendary whale that took off his leg, unmasted him in Ahab's own word, till one of them was dead. Ahab's unwillingness to accept the fundamental structure of reality, essentially his smallness and mortality in the face of nature's vastness and indifference, well, this spirit seemed to possess and haunt the ship's entire journey, leaving his officers and even the lowliest crew members questioning Ahab's sanity. Ahab often shared his crew's doubts about him. When Ahab speaks, it's usually in quick, sharp sentences that get crewmen leaping out of his way or into a task. But several times throughout the story, Ahab is prompted to a long soliloquy by some event, object, or, in this final case, a question from his first mate, Starbuck, and Ahab's reflections serve as epiphanic in my book, even if they aren't quite as clear-cut an epiphany as Joyce's Araby. Here's how Ahab reacts when Starbuck asks him to reject his compulsion to hunt Moby Dick and to turn back home the night before the final showdown. What is it? What nameless, inscrutable, unearthly thing is it? What cousining hidden lord and master and cruel, remorseless emperor commands me, that against all natural lovings and longings, I so keep pushing, and crowding, and jamming myself on all the time, recklessly making me ready to do what in my own proper natural heart I durst not so much as dare. 
Is Ahab Ahab? Is it I, God, or who that lifts this arm? But if the great sun move not of himself, but is as an errand boy in heaven, nor one single star can revolve, but by some invisible power, how then can this one small heart beat, this one small brain think thoughts, unless God does that beating, does that thinking, does that living, and not I? By heaven, man, we are turned round and round in this world, like yonder windlass, and fate is the handspike. And all the time, lo, that smiling sky, and this unsounded sea, look, see on Albacore. Who put it in him to chase and fang that flying fish? Where do murderers go, man? Who's to doom when the judge himself is dragged to the bar? But it is a mild, mild wind in a mild-looking sky, and the air smells now, as if it blew from a faraway meadow. They have been making hay somewhere under the slopes of the Andes, Starbuck, and the mowers are sleeping among the new-mown hay. Sleeping. I. Toil how we may, we all sleep at last on the field. This is certainly meaning writ large. A psychologist might make the case that this is simply Ahab justifying actions he knows to be foolish by passing the buck to God instead. Hey, God made me as such, don't blame me, Starbuck, blame him. But this speech by Ahab seems far too sincere to be that cynical. There's pathos in it. Ahab is feeling this sentiment deeply, sincerely questioning why he can't simply forget the feudal chase. He seems to legitimately mirror the albacore, almost helplessly compelled to chase and fang after Moby Dick, even if it means his ruin. And surely this epiphany echoes real life in so many ways. Who doesn't know someone who can't stop chasing something they're absolutely consumed by, even if it destroys them? Cigarettes, an abuse of X, drugs, gambling, work, political ambition. So many people end up getting destroyed by their greatest desires, even in the face of their certain comprehension of how the story ends. They do it anyway, as Ahab does, with just as much of a heavy heart as Starbuck, whose impassioned pleading falls on Ahab's deaf, longing ears. So after all this, what does Moby Dick mean? which is to say, what is its theme? To me, this isn't a story of man against nature, so much as it is a story of men against nature. I'm going to make what may be a controversial assertion by saying that the reason this book still resonates is that the whale isn't really all that important. In fact, the whale isn't even the most important symbol in the book. There's something far more meaningful here, even than the eternal theme of a hunt against a dangerous foe. If you blink during chapter 36, you might even miss it, with all the activity, shouts, toasts, cheering, and aggrandizing speeches Ahab gives. But this is the moment, the setting of the real terms of their voyage. Ahab gathers all the men at the quarterdeck and asks every one of them to vow with him to hunt Moby Dick to the ends of the earth. And as a reward, he presents a Spanish doubloon for the man who first sights the infamous whale. Ahab then quite theatrically nails this doubloon to the main mast, and here they are, a perfectly ordered hierarchical society gathered underneath a massive wooden cross, and what do they nail to that cross but the spoils of a blasphemous oath? Starbuck says as much. Vengeance on a dumb brute, cried Starbuck, that simply smote thee from blindest instinct? Madness! To be enraged with a dumb thing, Captain Ahab, seems blasphemous. This sets Ahab off on another epic soliloquy that defines their entire ill-formed quest. All visible objects, man, are but as pasteboard masks. But in each event, in the living act, the undoubted deed, there, some unknown but still reasoning thing puts forth the moldings of its features from behind the unreasoning mask. If man will strike, strike through the mask. How can the prisoner reach outside except by thrusting through the wall? To me, the white whale is that wall, shoved near to me. Sometimes I think there's not beyond, but tis enough. He tasks me, he heaps me. I see in him outrageous strength with an inscrutable malice sinewing it. 
That inscrutable thing is chiefly what I hate. And be the white whale agent or be the white whale principal, I will wreak that hate upon him. Talk not to me of blasphemy, man. I'd strike the sun if it insulted me. For could the sun do that, then could I do the other, since there is ever a sort of fair play herein, jealousy presiding over all creations. But not my master, man, is even that fair play. Who's over me? And here we arrive at Ahab's fatal flaw, the same as every hero of every Greek myth, Ahab's hubris. Who's over me? isn't a question but a statement that no one is. It speaks to that unwillingness to recognize reality which I mentioned earlier. Ahab will not recognize his place in nature. He, instead, vows to strike out at it willfully. This is a transgression of cosmological proportions, and if there's one thing we can always count on in a story, every transgression gets punished, and the bigger the transgression, the bigger the punishment. All the chips are on the table here, and from that moment on, the Pequod is doomed. The cross here, the very main mast of the ship, mind you, is symbolic of the very center of civilization in the Western world. Medieval cities planned their entire layout around their cross-shaped cathedrals, whose center vault rose directly over the altar, the heart of the church. And this fraternal whaling society, the Puritan, rigidly Christian whaling ship, represents a strict, ordered society, pulled onward by their very cross, helmed by a madman. That's what this story is about. It's about what happens when the hierarchy goes wrong. It's one of the most compelling stories we have in all of literature, from Hamlet to the Iliad to Game of Thrones. What do we do when the king is corrupt, tyrannical, or mad? That's the meaning in Moby Dick. And the way Ishmael tells this well-known tale is what makes it unique. He highlights the perspectives of all the men as they slowly come to realize there's something off about this voyage. He offers the perspectives of the very different officers, some solemn and stoic, others jocular and carefree. He shows the reaction of the truly diverse and multicultural crew who all need to pull in the same direction, compelled by the same goals. We all recognize this story because it's real and meaningful. It poses and poses and poses the question, what do you do when the hierarchy goes wrong? It's a chronicle of the moment your boss's boss foolishly begins to run your company into the ground, through arrogance, through incompetence, or through ignorance or malice, or some combination of all these things. What should you say or do? When do you jump ship? That it's all over a whale in Moby Dick is a doubly poetic stroke, a call for a condor's quill from a witty genius with a sly sense of humor and a youth spent on whaling ships. This kind of meaning makes for the stuff of literary immortality. But fiction doesn't have to be that way. We can't all be immortals, that's for sure. Sometimes our tales aren't quite writ that large. What then? Well, frankly, symbolism, epiphanies, and overarching themes are tools that can be more easily abused than used. So unless you're reaching for a condor's quill yourself, best to wield these forces with due care. Even if you aren't consciously aware of your story's theme, rest assured that readers, pattern-recognizing animals that they are, will find some way to read one or more into your story for you. And to make up for being a little harsh on Professor King in the last section, I'll give him a lot of credit here for approaching this topic with the most sensible viewpoint I've encountered on the matter. He states, Symbolism exists to adorn and enrich, not to create a sense of artificial profundity. I think that, when you read your manuscript over, you'll see if symbolism or the potential for it exists. If it doesn't, leave well enough alone. If it does, however, go for it. Enhance it. You're a monkey if you don't. The same things are true of theme. Writing and literature classes can be annoyingly preoccupied with theme, approaching it as the most sacred of sacred cows, but it's really no big deal. Once your basic story is on paper, you need to think about what it means to enrich your following drafts with your conclusions. To do less is to rob your work of the vision that makes each tale you write uniquely your own. Perhaps Melville sat down with all the symbolism that the whale entails in his mind, 
but I'm not sure he fully grasped the symbolic importance of the cross and the hierarchy. He wrote from experience, having survived a stint on a cannibal-filled island after fleeing a tyrant of a whaling ship captain himself. I'm not sure Melville understood he was tapping so deeply into the roots of human society when he conjured Ahab from who knows where. But as the story goes, he revised the novel a few times, each time magnifying the scope of Ahab's vendetta against Moby Dick at the behest of his friend Nathaniel Hawthorne, no small literary figure himself. But it must have occurred to Melville at some point to enlarge the scope of the human story, to emphasize the hubris of Ahab taking on such a force of nature. All that started with a simple whaling journey born out of his own seafaring experience. I think Stephen King is largely correct here. Tell a story first. Make it a human story with important magnetic plot elements, and significant symbols are likely to present themselves, perhaps even with obvious places to sharpen them on revision. What exactly did Melville know? It's a complicated question that brings us all the way back to the beginning of these lessons. To credit Melville's conscious mind with direct intention when he created a work with multiple deep symbolic meanings would be to ascribe to him near omniscience. Absurd. Yet to say that he didn't know much about what he was writing is to take away the genius that is rightly his on so many levels. This is the issue we began with. When an author makes 10 million decisions in the course of writing a novel, what does he really know about those decisions? No matter how technical we get, into the theory of writing fiction, writing will still be a largely intuitive art. Literary writer Robert Boswell calls this phenomenon the half-known world. It's a bit like the difference between a flat and a round character. The round contains just enough facets to convince the reader of their reality. They seem like people with depth enough that there will always be something mysterious left in them. This holds true for literary fiction in a larger sense that the story world is ordered enough to be familiar and chaotic enough to be interesting. Still further, the writer, to my mind, no matter how well they hone their craft, will only ever half know what they're doing when they create a new fiction. The rest bubbles up from beneath the surface, defying clear articulation. And that's likely where meaning lies, just out of reach of reason. Metaphors writ large, symbols, epiphanies, and themes, are such a feature of written fiction because great literary fiction should be operating in a territory that is ineffable or unexplained, a place where we don't already have words for the feelings and emotions that arise from such circumstances. Fiction is an exploratory art, and thus we find ourselves dealing with novel surroundings and circumstances, and often we need help from the world we know to make sense of the new world we've just encountered for the first time. Enter the metaphor, writ large. Enter meaning. I'm writing this from the 16th floor of the Ellison Building in Massachusetts General Hospital. I'm in the lounge, the southern wall of which is entirely glass, overlooking Beacon Hill and the financial district in Boston. It is a shining spring day with blue skies and puffy clouds. The tall, glass and stone facades of the skyscrapers in the financial district tower over Old Beacon Hill, a neighborhood of brick townhouses that run up along a gentle slope all the way to the gold-domed state house that juts out at the top of the hill, glistening. Behind it, the Boston Common and public gardens are starting to come into the fullness of a green spring, flowers and leaves opening in the warm sun after a long winter. All of the streets below me are old and well-traveled. Paul Revere, Henry Adams and John Kennedy walk these streets. I walk them now. The 16th floor is a cancer ward. I'm taking a break from a visit with my younger brother, who is down the hall being treated for a severe and excruciatingly painful stage 4 bone cancer that is likely to be fatal. I work with words. I am a master of them, and I find myself quite understandably inarticulate Sucks is the word that keeps coming up whenever I talk to my extended family and friends who want to know how he's doing. How else does one describe a young man in his prime, degenerating into unspeakable pain and complete debilitation in the span of a handful of months? 
How do you describe how his wife is doing as she watches the love of her life, her best friend, slowly, seemingly, helplessly dying? Friends, we still don't have words for this. What is the meaning there? I could give you an answer. Several, if you like. If I were religious, I could tell you about God's will, the journey we all must walk, and the suffering we must bear, the cross we must carry if you're a Christian. Would you like an answer from philosophy, Western or Eastern? I could give you a scientific answer to the reason we all must suffer and die. It's called senescence. Look it up if you don't know. It's a damn useful thing to know. Why did my brother get bone cancer at 35? Genetics is the answer the doctors gave him, though there are likely some unknown and unknowable environmental factors that triggered healthy bone cells to rapidly divide out of control when they did. Statistically, it has to happen to somebody, and my brother's number came up. These are all answers that ring true. These answers hardly scratch the surface, though. The GRE word for that is specious. I don't know what it's like to have bone cancer eat away at my spine. I know it's painful because of the way my brother reacts, but I also know from this that I don't really know what pain is. Not this pain. Not even close. I hope I never do. I don't think I could take it. It's a perfect spring day outside this window. The Bruins are in the finals. The birds are singing. And the weather is finally warm. If my brother is still with us next year, It'll be another small miracle for the oncologist here at MGH. What is meaning? Now that I've written what I've written here, half known is far too generous a characterization of what we know. Maybe fiction can tell us something about the things we don't know. Maybe it can explain why my sister-in-law is always on the edge of breaking down while I just feel numb. If I couldn't feel the tension in my neck, I wouldn't feel the slightest bit of difference from an ordinary day, except for the rare moments I feel it in my gut. He feels it always in his bones. And what to God does that mean to him? I haven't the foggiest idea, and likely neither does he. Write what you know, they say. It's laughable, utterly laughable. We know so little that's worth writing about. Great fiction comes from places we cannot touch and only faintly comprehend. With a great deal of luck and effort, we may acquire the skills required to make the things we don't know known to others so that they may share in our experience and hard-earned wisdom, if we have any. You could try and do that. That would be meaningful. And so much for subtext.